All right, then. We're going to give this a shot here. Today, we're going to talk about um, what biotechnology is and how it got started. So here we go. So biotechnology is using biology to solve problems. We manipulate life or biology to make useful things like technology. Biotechnology influences nearly all aspects of our lives today, including what we eat, what we wear, the homes we live in, and what we use for transportation. According to a recent estimate, about 200,000 people work in biotechnology in the United States, generating almost $100 billion in annual revenues. There are at least 100 scientific journals that focus on biotechnology, so new research reports appear literally every day. Biotechnology is an exciting, fast-moving field, but it is also challenging to keep up with the latest findings. Although biotechnology is modern and high-tech, it actually has very ancient origins, going back to the very beginning of human civilization. Biotechnology, in the broad sense of the word, has taken place in jungles, farms, kitchens, backyards, and even caves for thousands of years. This means products of biotechnology include crops, such as tomatoes and corn, fermented foods, such as vinegar and wine, and domesticated animals. Biotechnology was first used in prehistoric times, thousands of years before the invention of writing, when people shifted from hunting and gathering to farming. Early farming likely resembled forest gardens, where people began to recognize and protect valuable food sources and remove undesirable species. Later, people began to keep animals and form permanent settlements where they grew their own food. Evidence of plant sowing and harvesting dates back more than 9,000 years to the Fertile Crescent of the Middle East. Domestication is the generation of new varieties and breeds at, by means of human intervention and is an example of biotechnology. The process of domestication is usually done by selective breeding. People choose what individual plants or animals they allow to reproduce. Usually they select only the best individuals, the plants or animals with the most desirable traits, to reproduce. Selective breeding over hundreds of years has radically altered the foods we eat. For example, a wild tomato is very different from any kind of tomato you can find in the grocery store. Let's see here if I can pen. So this is a wild tomato. This is what you see in the grocery store, right? We selectively bred bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger to get to here. Another part of human expansion of agriculture was the domestication of wild animals so that they could be used for food, protection, companionship, and other purposes. Dogs were probably the first animal domesticated by humans starting around 12,000 years ago. Picture a grocery store well stocked with produce section. There are many different colors and types of apples, red and green seedless grapes, different varieties of lettuce, and numerous melons, peaches, plums, nectarines. Consider potatoes. How many different types of potatoes can you think of? There are purple, yellow, white, red skin varieties, and they come in all sizes. All of these varieties, even the organic ones, are the result of selective breeding. In other words, they are the product of genetic manipulation by humans. They are the result of biotechnology. You can also look in the dairy section. Look at all the bottles of milk and butter, yogurt, dozens of types of cheese, ice cream, cream cheese, sour cream. Picture the breads, cakes, muffins. Most of these foods are also the product of biotechnology, either from selective breeding or because they are produced using microorganisms. How did early people store or preserve food? Without electricity refrigerators, they invented ways to alter food so it would keep longer. This is another type of early biotechnology. Cheese, for example, lasts longer than milk and is easier to transport. Cheese is produced when certain enzymes and or bacteria are combined with milk. Cheese may have been discovered accidentally when milk was stored in vessels made from the stomachs of animals, exposing it to natural cheese-making enzymes. Archaeologists have found clay pots in Europe that are over 7,000 years old and were probably used for producing cheese. Ancient civilizations used simple biotechnology methods to improve crops and food, but there is no sign that people understood how or why these techniques worked. This changed in the 1800s and 1900s when a series of discoveries advanced the understanding of cells, inheritance, and DNA. Much of what biotechnology researchers focus on today lies in the cell nucleus. Robert Brown used the term nucleus for the first time in a paper in 1833. He used a microscope to view orchid cells and took note of the opaque spot in the cell. Brown sensed that the opaque spot was important and called it the nucleus, the term we still use today for that spot, which we now know houses DNA, the code of life. Brown thought that only plant cells had nucleus, or nuclei, but later research showed that the animal cells also have them. This is an example of how the initial discovery of something often contains some misunderstandings or inaccuracies. 
Brown was right about the nuclei, but wrong to think that they were only found in plant cells. Organisms that have cell nuclei are classified as eukaryotes. Do you remember from biology what we call organisms that lack a nuclei? Yep, we call them prokaryotes. And all known prokaryotes are single-celled organisms. Bacteria, for example, are prokaryotes. Prokaryotes still have DNA, but is not contained in the nucleus. In 1881, oops, there we go back to these guys. Walter and Franny Hess discovered that agar, a gelatinous substance made in seaweed, could be used to grow bacteria. Agar is an important tool in biotechnology because it allows scientists to keep bacteria in the lab under controlled conditions. Gregor Mendel's experiments with pea plants led him to propose the idea of what we now call genes, microscopic internal units of information, one from each parent that produces offspring with a mix of paternal traits, but which are passed on without blending. A different version of a gene, called an allele, comes from each parent. If an allele is dominant, its corresponding trait will always be expressed. A recessive allele will always be expressed only when both alleles present are recessive. This discovery was important because it suggested how information might be passed from one generation to the next. Before Mendel, people realizing that offspring resembled their parents, but lacked any understanding of why or how it happened. They didn't have the idea of the gene. When you hear the term cloning, you probably think of modern biotechnology, or maybe science fiction movies about cloned humans. But cloning, the production of two completely identical organisms, isn't new. An important landmark in cloning came over a century ago when, 19, in 1996, Dolly the Sheep became the first mammal to be cloned. Mammal embryos are more complicated and delicate than embryos of species like sea urchins, so much more advanced techniques were required. Being able to produce genetically identical organisms is useful in research. For example, having identically Having genetically identical individuals allow for you to test the impact of different environmental conditions on their growth and development. In September 1928, Alexander Fleming went to his lab after a vacation. He was not happy with what he saw. Some agar dishes he was using to grow bacteria had been contaminated with mold. He thought they were ruined, but a few days later he noticed that in one dish the mold had killed the bacteria. Instead of just throwing off the dish, he realized this was important. With the help of another scientist, he determined that the mold was a species known as Penicillin notatum. Fleming had discovered the antibiotic penicillin. Because of its ability to kill bacteria, penicillin is estimated to have saved over 80 million lives since it was introduced. Fleming discovered it because he was observant and tried to understand what he saw, even if it wasn't a formal experiment. Remember, the mold he saw in the dish was an accident. Sometimes errors can lead to important discoveries if we are paying attention. Penicillin wasn't used as a drug until around 1940. Why the delay? Because he was not a chemist. He did not have the skills to produce penicillin on his own. It took him 10 years to convince the chemists that penicillin had the potential as a drug. This is a common story in biotechnology. It could take years to translate a laboratory discovery into something people can actually use. In 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick deduced the structure of DNA and started modern biotechnology. How did they figure out the structure? They guessed, but in a very scientific way. They looked at reports about the characteristics of DNA from different scientists, especially Rosalind Franklin, and came up with the idea of what DNA might look like in order to fi fit with those characteristics. Watson and Crick used the metal parts representing the different atoms of the DNA to build a model of the structure. The first model turned out to be wrong, but after several tries, they hit on a double helix structure that matched the measurements of DNA and other people like Franklin had made. The structure was important. First, the two parallel strands of DNA suggested that DNA might copy itself by unzipping the two strands. Second, the four different nucleotide bases suggested that DNA might control the cell by using its bases as an alphabet to spell out instructions. Since DNA is passed from parent to child, the sequence of bases could transmit information from one generation to the next. It took many years to figure this out. So biotechnology has come a long way. It started over 10,000 years ago when people first started using selective breeding to make more useful kinds of crops. The pace of discovery started to accelerate in the 1800s, and even more discoveries were made in the 1900s like penicillin and the structure of DNA. Next time, we'll discuss how biotechnology has continued to progress since the 1950s. So it's important to understand where we came from and where it might be headed.